Um, so I'm supposed to be appraising these appraisals. Um, and the task here, there, there are more of these appraisals. In fact, I even got one of the wrong hip. So I'll be discussing Andrea's, um, Francois's, and Stephen's work, which look at the World Top Income Database, the Seppelstadt and Sedlak databases, and the WID and the SWID, as we've just all heard. I, Martin Revalian, who's not here, did an appraisal of LIS. And in fact, I'll, as I'll explain in a minute, I was kind of involved in, I, I read that very carefully for a reason I'll, I'll look at. Some of the issues he raised I'll kind of briefly refer to, but, um, but I won't be discussing his, his appraisal here since he's, he's not here to, he, he's neither presented it nor, nor discussed it. But, but I should say a couple of, give a couple of disclaimers. Essentially to say that I'm, to some extent, I'm, I'm a guilty party here. I've been the research director of the Luxembourg Income Study list which appears in many of these appraisals um, for, the, for, for the past nine years, including two major d revisions of the database. So whatever's wrong with those should be partly blamed on me. Um, when I was here, as, as Tony just said, I, in fact, advised the person doing the WID revision, um, and I also provided uh, the data for, for the list data points for the WID. In fact, I re-estimated them. That was part of the thing, thing we did in cleaning them. And I also, Stephen makes a point about finished data being kind of a little all over the place. I provided many of the series um, for the original um, uh, WID, and I also did the estimates um, for the top incomes database for Finland. So I've kind of been as both a data provider and, and, and in a sense of, of a designer of some of these databases, much involved of this. So um, many of the criticisms um, that have appeared kind of uh, apply to my contributions. Now, appraisals such as the ones we've heard of today, um, and indeed the others here, are quite useful. They provide a, a kind of careful scrutiny in a systematic way of the databases they're looking at. Of course, the problem is this, that uh, once you have an appraisal of a database, you know a lot about especially what's wrong with those databases. And, but, but then the databases that aren't scrutinized, people will tend to think, well, there's not much wrong with them. And one of the things that Francois's appraisal raises is, although Francois actually makes this point quite clearly, is that while we may want to benchmark household survey data against national accounts, it doesn't follow that there's nothing wrong with national accounts data. So, you have kind of two moving targets, if you will, that, that, that are being appraised. And in fact, I'd like to see somebody write really detailed reports about particular sets of national accounts uh, to have a discussion of, of the ways in which, for instance, calculation methods and data sources have changed across time and, and this and that. Um, I used to work at Statistics Finland, the st statistical office here, and the kind of stories you hear from national accountants were, were um, do not... Um, lend you to believe that uh, any given statistic from the national accounts is God's final truth on, on, on a particular matter. Um, I'm, I'm going to be relatively brief, and I, I will at the end actually have a, 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 one major criticism of, of all of these appraisals, so I, I won't only be praising them, so to speak. But, but it's useful to think about what we actually do with these inequality databases. Why do, why do we have them? There are different uses. One is that we want to assess distributional information at the country year level. We may want to compare trends within countries. We may even want to compare levels across countries. Um, and one of the things that, that's kind of actually lacking or wasn't much discussed in these appraisals was, well, suppose you want to do something else than look at inequality and poverty. Um, suppose you want to do real income comparisons of some sort. Then you get a totally new level of of complexity again about comparing real in incomes across countries and so on. So, and, and first of all, those need to be appraised and evaluated for, for usefulness. And uh, but also, um, you may there may be benefits to, to providing that information in, in the same go. And and I, I saw little discussion about these things. Now, we 
use these databases also to explain distribution. So essentially have distributional information on the left hand side. And then we use the distributional information in two different ways um, to explain other things. One of them is to explain stuff like economic growth or, or some other aggregate outcome. But, but as Stephen points out, it's also sometimes used um, in combination with lower level data, in particular unit record data, to explain things like people's political attitudes as a ba based on inequality in their countries and so on. And that's a, these kind of using distributional information on the right hand side raises other kinds of, of problems relative to their quality than, than, than using them on, on, on the left hand side. And, and Stephen, I think, quite nicely in his discussion of SWID, kind of makes a point about how, how biases, that is, differences in in what is supposed to be measured and, and the thing that you have to measure it um, affect these different kinds of analyses and how impreciseness, variability in the thing that's being measured can, can have an, uh, an impact. Um, both of these, well, all, all of these papers together give a very nice, well, a nice but, but quite brief summary of the kinds of dimensions along which inequality statistics vary. There are issues to do with the definition of the income distribution, um, an important one being the difference between income and consumption, um, but there are other, lots of other things as well, reference periods, units of analysis and so on. There are big differences, although especially Steve is a little vaguer on this, about data sources. Um, and then there's a lot about the processing of the data that are used to produce the single number, the inequality index that you're going to be using. And anybody who's ever used any microdata to produce these numbers knows that, that from this multitude of choices arises a great range of, of, of different estimates. Um, and there's really no very good reason to, to, to think that, that there is a single correct choice on any of this, but of course if you use aggregate statistics that's what you, what you end up with. Um, I will give my one criticism and then I'll kind of end with, with some conclusion. I won't go through the, the separate papers. I, I do think they're all very worthwhile to read. Stephen's paper runs across 63 pages of text, tables and figures, so you so you may want to stock up with coffee to plow through it, but, but it, it, it has a lot to commend it. For instance, it has an extremely uh, clear and brief discussion about what multiple implementation actually does. So if you ever want to read a two-page summary of that, I recommend this paper for you. However, the single substantial criticism of these appraisals is that not, not a single one of them actually refers to any international standards on the measurement of, of income or distribution. These are five reasonably well known. It's not an exhaustive list of, of, of um, reports which actually try to f figure out that for the dis what kind of income and consumption definition should we be using in order to make distributional comparisons, starting with the UN provisional guidelines uh, from 1977, the two Canberra reports, and finally uh, the OECD had a number of working groups, uh, one report from which is a framework on for statistics on the distribution of household income, consumption, and wealth. Uh, these are cited in none of these papers, and one kind of wonders why. Um, because there is a lot of work on, uh, and indeed, I, I think Martin Revalian does cite these, but he doesn't seem to think very highly of them because he kind of does very much his own thing when it comes to what Liz should have been doing. I'm not bitter, but... but um, <laughs> Now, this brings me to, the, to my last concluding comment, and it's the following. One of the impressions I think you should have gotten from the three presentations, um, in, in fact the four presentations we just heard, is that there's a lot of information about inequality um, and income distribution out there. There are big gaps in what we know. In particular, we know far too much about rich countries and far too little about less rich countries. Um, but also the things we tend to know are v vary a lot 
by particular configurations of data sets that you're looking at and so on. And the thing that's always bewildered me is that why do we collectively, in fact, in the world, but also within countries, use tremendous amounts of money to, to produce um, national account statistics highly regularly, but distributional statistics are mainly produced as uh, almost an afterthought in general in research projects as, as kind of in, in a highly non-institutionalized way um, with the result that they're essentially all over the place. So if there actually is some kind of revealed preference, which somehow you might argue there isn't, but if there is a, reveal, if there is a preference for, for actually having accurate distributional information, the question is why is it actually not being provided in, in, in an institutionalized way um, as, in fact, our national accounts statistics. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh,